Hey everybody who's been who's joining you now or maybe watching it later or probably watching it later. Um, this is going to be the second episode of uh, the series in which I'm going to be trying to learn a little bit of Rust. Um, I'm going to be following this book, the Rust Lang book. Um, and we did chapter one last time. And uh, the goal for today is to go through um, chapter two and program a guessing game. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the book I'm running through. Chapter two is today. Um, so yeah, let's go. It's programming a guessing game. So guessing game is a beginner programming problem, guessing game, computer generates a number between one and a hundred and you want to guess it. Uh, basically doing some sort of a binary search. So as everything in Rust appears to be the way of doing stuff, you start with cargo commands. So I'm going to go cargo new guessing game. Maybe guessing game. Okay. Um, we have the Tomo file. Um, as expected, we've got everything inside of it that we'd want to have. We're going to have a main file probably with Hello World. Uh, don't even need to check it. Cargo run should give me a Hello World, which is, yeah, Hello World, there it is. Try again. That was fast. Terrific. Processing a game. So I guess what we have to do is to start mucking around with inputs and outputs, which would be interesting to learn how do we do these things in Rust. So um, let's look into main, or, oh, sorry. So sources are inside source, right? Right. So that's where we go. Let's make it a little bit bigger. That's more than that. That's probably enough. So, guess the number. Number. And I'm gonna, instead of copying and pasting, I wanna I type myself a little bit so I'm gonna get used to how the language feel, right? Because I mean, copying and pasting is easy. Uh, it would have been faster as well, but I just want to get used to, you know, have some muscle memory on how this language feels like when you code in it. So, okay, let mute. Mute means this guess is mutable because I'm going to be needing to read from it. Uh, okay, that's weird. I'm going to be reading. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, I'm creating a new instance of a string. And then I'm going to be reading into that instance. That's um, a little bit different from how I'm used to think about strings being always an immutable thing. So I guess I'm going to have to uh, drill a little bit into, into this into this later. And how when oops, I want to read from STP in read line at mute. So I wonder what this at mute means. Is this like the address of the mutable string guess. And if I pass the address to readline, then readline will be able to put information into that address or something. Expect failed to readline. There's a lot of many things that are going on here and I have no idea what's going on. So it's going to be interesting to learn and understand what all the things are doing. So um, if we're talking about guessing games, I have a guess here, and my guess is that um, this expect thing, so basically, so read line is going to be a function that basically returns some sort of a success, like it should, it could be a success or error because it's an I/O thing, right? Because read line could be right now it's like from the from the console from the keyboard, but it could be from a file or a socket or whatever. And then any of these things could fail. So this thing probably returns an error or something. And then this expect function would 
panic or something if it's actually broken, if something bad happened. Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, for sure, one thing that that happens here is I do not do this. Use this TP deal. Um, the 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 only sure thing right now that I can be sure of is that I have really no idea what's going on. So yeah, that's fun. Let's see if this thing uh, compiles. So if I go correctly, there's cargo test or cargo something that's to run something without. Uh, to make sure that it compiles, so that would be cargo not run, not test, not bench, not update. It was like something. I remember there was a command that was. Let's go back. Go back to hello world cargo version. Cargo something. There was a. I'm pretty sure there was like a cargo build it, but don't do anything. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe it's just a rest. Compile uh, cargo check. Okay, cargo check found you. So we'll go to do here and cargo check. Well, yeah, looking good. Um, no errors. Um, so yeah. So I, um, big success. I managed to copy everything in here without breaking anything. So that's good. Let's look at what's going on inside here. So the code contains lots of information, sure, blah, blah, blah. Use STDIO, I guess this is just, you know, like any import or using or anything like that. that so that's fine. Function main, we know about this. Those are the macro that print things out. We'll learn about macros later. Storing values of variables. Okay, so the program is getting interesting. We got let, which is creating a variable. Let full equals bar, can create a full variable, puts whatever is in bar in it. In Rust, variables are mutable by default. I like this already. We're discussing this concept in detail later, chapter three. So that's probably not today. Maybe we'll see how it goes. So I can do let foo equals five, let mute, bar equals five. Um, mute, moot, mute, I say it was mutable. Um, blah, 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 slash, slash, comments, blah, blah, blah. Let mute guess will introduce a mutable variable named guess. On the other side is a string new, creating a new instance of a string. Provided by salary, it's growable. Oh, it's a growable UDF encoded bit and encoded bit of text. So it's growable. It's very different from any other implementation of string in, or let's say, standard library implementation of string that I've work within the path in the past I think I mean C++ doesn't really have any standard strings right so everybody has their own um, some of them were growable some of them were not but in most most major languages a string is not growable um, it's basically an array of bytes so that's interesting okay the double colon syntax in double double colon in in new line indicates it's an associated function of the string type which is Kind of like I guess a static function on classes in like in C C style languages or should I say Java style languages? An associated function or C plus plus style language. An associated function is implemented on a type. In this case string. Are done on a particular instance. New function creates a new empty string. You'll find a new function on many types. Okay, that's Okay, iOS CD in, that would be a function on the IO module in this case, just like the new function on the string class or type. We could have done that maybe it on IO if we didn't do the use. Makes sense. This calls the read line thing, and we're passing at mute guess. The at indicates that the argument is a reference. Gives you a way to let multiple parts of your code access one piece of data without needing to copy the data into memory multiple times. Complex feature, Rust made our advantage, how to make it safe. Um, I've heard about the concept of ownership in, in Rust, which is um, basically thinking of a, a, a single piece of executing code owns the reference at a time and then because it owns it, it would probably be the one that needs to clean up from memory layer, which is how Rust can um, 
can you know avoid using garbage collection but still be be memory safe that's uh i guess i'm gonna have to learn it later we don't know any of the details makes sense it would still work blah 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 need write mute guess because because we're going to change it da, 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 da. okay and handling potential failure expect this so when you call a method with the full syntax it's often wise to introduce a new line in other to to break things right? okay makes sense no. so what's the thing okay so it returns an io result oh okay so it's some so it's going to be some kind of a wrapper that has uh, that has the options of being failure or success and if it's error then the expect thing is going to do something yeah so expect is gonna work on the result and i guess if it sees something that is not okay it's gonna freak out and panic with uh with whatever string message we we gave it so you don't go expect it will compile and get a warning oh because there probably there's a dangling result and you didn't do anything with it so we need to we have to do something with the result otherwise the compiler is going to be a little bit angry with us that's that's cool. I think that would be similar to how if you have in Go you have a return value uh, error as a second return value in a tuple and, and and you ignore it, then it'll tell you, hey, there's something here that you that you did not use. Maybe you wanna do something with that. So so um, Uri is asking um, expect crashes on error. What that could do? First of all, I'm not sure that that's what happens. I think it's gonna panic on the error. Um, but what is it good for? It's good for um, when, like any error that you cannot really cannot recover from, and in this case, we did not, we can't recover from this in any way at, at the moment. Then we would want to crash and you know stop the program. I guess there should be a way for me also to look into the result and say, well, if it's an error, maybe you know, provide a prompt to the user, say, hey, this that was an error. Please write it again. Please, please give me some more information. Um, so if I could recover, I guess I don't call expect. If I if I want to recover, I guess I just do something with the uh, with the result object instead of instead of calling the expect function. So the expect function is probably the thing that's going to freak out. Probably very useful in tests um, and also in top level application or where you or where you do you have things that you know you cannot recover from, which are you know things that are totally unexpected. All right, cool. That's a good question. Uh, printing values with printlin placeholders okay we talked about this before uh, there's a placeholder thing think of it as little crab pinchers that hold a value in place okay you can print more than one value in curly brackets uh, i want to guess that maybe you can pass in like named parts so i don't know we'll see about this probably formatting as well go into all of this testing the first parts cargo run Please input your guess. You guess something. Let's see. So, cargo run. Please input your guess. Four. Woohoo! I tried. Please input your guess. Um, roar. And please input your guess. Your guess, and we'll go to a break. What happens? It just breaks. Um, what if I do? I know something like. Nah, just passed and enter. So yeah, we, we don't do any validation on what we got back. Generating a secret number. I guess we'll do validations later, you know, make sure that it's a number, I guess, between 1 and 100. So we want to create a number between 1 and 100. It's probably a rand. Yes, there is a rand. Oh, there is no rand. It's a dependency. So we need to add a dependency. Cool. Okay, okay, okay. So rand is going to come in. From some sort of a library or crate or library crate maybe it's a kind of a crate which is a library probably there are other crates okay so we want to add a dependency into the tomo file guy I go to the dependencies and we'll say rend I love it how in Rust everything is like version zero point whatever. I mean, come on, we've been using it for a while. Probably we could, we could call it a one. 
Anyway, in a cargo tunnel file, I think that follows the header by the section of the adventures, it will tell you where to go. Da, 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 da. 055. So this is a semantic versioning, which I liked, means generally means you know the um the numbers on the left are more significant than the numbers on, on the right, which is pretty common, but it also provides some sort of a a promise that when things change here, you don't have any any like this would not provide any changes to your program basically it's just uh, bug fixes changes here would add features but would not break existing features and changes here might break existing features so it's a it's a it's sort of a nice way to say 055 to 056 should be pretty harmless because it just fixes bugs and we should always do it uh, 05 to 06 is going to add some features and we want to think whether we want these features or not if you want to take dependency on like something higher and then changing this would require really 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 strong testing over my application because I might have, like things might break so yeah I like semantic versioning so 055 is a shortcut for uh, this hat 055 which means anything that is compatible with it so um, it might give me 056 or something I guess because it's compatible Right, let's see uh, what happens if I try to cargo run again. Okay, so it's going to be loading the thing. I'm going to also see this here. It's going to be pretty similar, I guess. Ooh, that, that's pretty slow for a for gigabit internet. What's going on? How big is brand? That's that, that's a little bit surprising. It takes longer than I expected. Okay, so we asked for RAND 055. We got 056. It's because it's just like a, a patch level, basically, it's probably just a fix, a bug fix or something. So it's saying, oh, it's safe enough to get it. I guess there would be a way for me to specify that I want this specific 055 if I really want to. Um, just to have repeatable builds and stuff like that. Because sometimes, you know, a tiny bug fix can introduce problems uh, when you're really in production. But during development, I guess this is good enough. Right, so I got RAN, which needs probably deep C because RAN probably is implemented somewhere in C for some reason. Or, 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 I, well, I don't know. It also downloaded two different versions of RAN core, whatever that is. And why do I need two versions? I have no idea, but I don't think the goal for me here is to be an expert on Rust, just to understand what's going on. All right, so please input your guess. Um, 500, nay. Okay, many different version numbers, blah, blah, blah. We have a dependency. We have a local copy of the indexed, or the registry, they call it. So we got the registry. We try to load something. We've got libc and ran core. Ran the build. It finished. And it ran. Da, 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 da. Okay, so there wasn't much changes yet anywhere. Now, if we do a if we do a change in main, then it would just main would change, but nothing else, so it should be fast. Ensuring reproducible build. Okay, so I talk about it a, a moment later, a moment before, which is if I want to lock down the specific version, there is going to be a lock file in which I can specify the specific specific versions, um, and then I get repeatable builds from my desktop through uh, continuous integration servers and then to production, which is important. So if I want to update now, I'm going to need to do cargo update. Cargo update would make updates to my stuff. All right, so yeah, cargo update would have updated 5.5 to 5.6. But if I want a newer version of RAND, then I'm going to change it to 0.6. Let's do it. Looks like them. Uh, I'm gonna change this to what 60? What was the recommendation? So 60 6 oh. now if I do cargo update, was it cargo update? Yeah, it's updating this. Five six to six five. Okay, so I ask for six zero. It goes all the way to six five, oh six five, and then there's like, yeah, tons of new dependencies, which I'm, I guess, you have to live with that. 
Um, there's a lot more to say about cargo and the ecosystem, and we talk about this later. Now we have RAND, we can start using it. So the main RS, there's a new, there's a new RAND in time. So this is going to take in the RAND library and the RNG, I guess, type, because this is a capital letter, maybe. Guess the number, create a secret number. So let's secret number equals red the red RNG. Okay, the red RNG probably it's a uh, it's a random number generator that is threaded. So the same because the same thread cannot do two things at the time. time this random generator, uh, random number generator is gonna we're gonna have uh, an instance of this per thread. So every time I call this. Um, it's going to be fast enough, so I don't need locking. Basically, there would be no locking inside of it. The only lock would be to just get a reference to the one that lives on my current thread, but then we'd be able to generate stuff without locks. That would be my guess. Gen range is probably something that would give me um, something inside 1 to 101, where 1 is inclusive and 1 is exclusive, which is, I guess, not how I would have expected this API to look like, but I guess that doesn't really matter. I mean, each language has its own idioms, and maybe the idiom here is that's how it's happening. Now, in order to make the game really difficult, I guess we're going to print out what I guess was the big secret is secret number. And then da 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 da, and we print the guess. Um, okay, let's go through this. So use range. Touchdown. We talk about this later. There's a oh, so RNG is not a type; it's a trait. We have no idea what traits are in Rust, so we'll learn this when we are in chapter ten. Okay, but we can call thread RNG function. It's a random number, concurrent thread. Or gen range, which is defined by the RNG trait. The range gives us something between 1 and 100. You won't just know which traits to use, which methods function to call from a crate. Instructions for the crate are in each crate's documentation. You can always do cargo doc dash dash open, which will build documentation provided. And open your browser. Whoa, if you're interested in other functionality, let's go. Whoa, I, 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 that's, that's awesome. Let's try to let's try to do this. So cargo doc dash dash open. Download everything. Oh, it's good. So it's downloading the documentation for everything in my current crates. Which is pretty cool. Um, but it couldn't document me. Oh, okay. Why? Try to run expression parentheses. Ooh, so this didn't work because oh, it's single colon. You know, I should have like double colon. So basically, I should have like cargo check this, and then it would have told me, ooh, that's really bad. Let's fix it. Right? That's what I sort of wanted to do. Cargo check. That's better. Cargo doc open. Oh, in the meantime, I'm just gonna need to open because because I'm running uh, inside the uh, I'm running in what do you call it it's WSL two on Windows. So my Linux thing, my Linux thing is a Windows subsystem for Linux, whatever it's called. Um, and in order to launch any GUI, it needs an X server running on the Windows side, which I just started. So I'm gonna try this again. And now it should launch my Chrome, which is, by the way, pretty neat. This Chrome window that you see here, um, you could see it looks a little bit weird as opposed like to the other one here. Um, that's because the rendering here. So this this runs inside the Linux machine. This is this is this is on the window. Oops, this is on on my Windows box on the on the host. You could say that's 
Uh, that guy is running uh, inside a Linux thing and it's rendered via the X forwarding uh, capabilities so it passed into my X window uh, manager that runs inside Windows and that's how it renders here. But that's not, you can see also, it's like it, it accesses directly into the into the, the Linux file system that I have. Anyway, pretty cool. So I got, I can go here and can look at RNG probably. Oh yeah, so I use current RNG and I have all the documentation locally. That's that's awesome. I think it's really cool. Um, yeah, I really like that you can get it locally and then, you know, well, once it downloads, you have all the information you want. Like, you can know what all this is, which I have no idea what any of this means. Some sort of a generic thing. There's a lot to learn in Rust. I gotta say, by the way, by this point, the time I spent learning Rust, uh, if it was Go, I would have known everything on the language. Because Go is like so tiny, and uh, I have actually experienced, lear I learned Go pretty quickly, but that's, you know, I don't know if it's good, um, if I'm, I'm a good example for this, but I did have an intern once that came in after a first year of learning computer science, and he never programmed before, and he, he, uh, he came in and he learned like Go in, uh, like, uh, like a day and then it was started it was it was productive pretty quick so yeah rust doesn't provide me the same experience it's not as easy to grasp but uh, there's a lot of power and a lot of things that i like about it already so yeah there's a lot to go more let's look at that so uri asks wait you have x11 set up with wsl2 of course sure i have i mean how else would i be able to do git go and git k right so i have to i, I have to have um my my x server run um i might have a I, I can do a quick you know run around this maybe separately from that um from, from that series about rust on how i have my wsl set up it's not very nifty and, and i mean it works basically uh but uh i think um the newest versions of wsl that are not public yet are going to be uh even easier to do like they they set up some sort of ways to really hook up the Windows windowing system to the the, the Linux kernel in WSL. I, I'm not sure what's going on there, but it should be easier and easier as time goes by. Yeah. So anyway, uh, done with this. Back here. Da -da -da -da. Uh, uh, so a guessing game. What we did with that. We did this. We did everything. Da -da -da. Talked about readland. Talked about printing, getting the secrets, cargo updates. Whoosh, there's a lot going on. Uh, 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 RNG. We got the docs. Coolio. All right. Second line we added in the middle of the code prints. So we talked about printing. It's just for now. Let's get rid of it later. Da -da 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 -da. So cargo run. I'm gonna get some number. Why is it downloading stuff again? Uh, oh, maybe it only downloaded the the docs last time, and now it's going to download the actual things. I run it again, 26, run it again, 23. I guess if I do it enough times, so it's always inside, um, inside the 1 to 100. So comparing. How do we compare things? Oof, let's see. Oh, wow. Okay, so when we compare numbers... That's... Okay, that's not... And that's really cool. So when you instead of comparing numbers, comparing integers is pretty easy, but generally speaking, comparing numbers, especially floating points, are not easy because uh, because of how accurate the numbers are, or uh, um, or you know, because of how how uh, how float po floating points numbers are represented on the computer. So it's a lot easier to get a response of less greater or less or greater. Uh, or, or equal generally, and, and then in float numbers, it's also about you know how accurate you want the comparison to be. So, um, I guess if you want to get used to doing comparisons in the way that returns something non Boolean, like multiple options, um, or maybe making the comparisons more elaborate, it also makes sense to do the same thing um, on, on integers, just you know. But I don't know, maybe it's maybe it's too much. Oh well actually this is because we don't wanna just check if it's okay. 
forget about that. Yeah, um, we probably could have used equals if we were just looking for equality. Like, I don't know, this is, this is match. But here we actually, because of the, how the guessing game works, we want to be low, like low, low or high. That's pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, let's see. Uh, it's telling me that it won't compile. I wonder why. So we have a new use here because we're going to use the CMP ordering. So CMP ordering, let me guess, it's going to be a trait that adds the, the CMP function on the guess thing. So I guess trait um, is a way for the language to add functionality to existing types. And probably it's not going to have access to the types internally, like to the internals of the type. So it would be pretty similar to um, maybe, uh, how would you call it, extension methods in C Sharp, maybe? Um, okay. So Matt is doing this. We add five new lines at the bottom, use ordering type, because match.cmp is going to return an ordering. Of less, greater, or equals. So ordering, no. So ordering is a type. It's an enum, but it's also bringing in .cmp, or maybe .cmp is part of guess already, and it wasn't a trade to begin with. Um, we're get the number. Match expression is made out of arms, and arm consists of a pattern. And a code would be run if the value given the meaning of match. So, okay, so pattern matching, and they have thing called arm um, instead of branches, I guess. Press takes the value into match, try to match it. Look through what happened with it. As if it's this, it's going to do that. If it's this, it's going to do that. If it's this, it's going to do that. Now, it's not going to compile because expected struct is to be string found integer. Okay, yeah, because we haven't parsed, because compare, it's going to compare an integer with an integer and a secret number, uh, or guess actually is a string and not a number. So it's going to try to do string dot compare number. And that's what it's telling us. The rand number is i32, it could be an unsigned 32, all kinds of this stuff. So what we would need to do is to take the number and parse it. Right, let's 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 type some code. So blah, 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 blah. that's the secret number that we got in. That's the guess we got. The mute guess here. Now we wanna parse it. So guess is a string. Wait, what? It allows us to do let guess. It's actually a what wait wait it changes what guess is we create a variable named guess but we already have a variable named guess so rust allows us to shadow the previous value with a new one switcher is often used in situations which you want to convert the value from one type to another so we don't need to do a guest str and then to a guest what that's mind-blowing actually because oftentimes okay so my first reaction is, wow, this is going to be confusing. Um, guess it was just an integer, or it was just a string, and now it's an integer, and it's going to confuse the heck out of me if I move, you know, functions around or whatever that uses the guess variable. But, but I mean, you know, in my experience, every time you do this sort of code, right, you, you always have the, like, the interim um, guess underscore str, or whatever you call it, like, wh whatever Hungarian notation you're going to put on the thing. And then you're gonna forget about it right after parsing. So that actually makes sense. I don't ah, that's okay. This language this language is hysterical. Okay, let's see. Let's guess. I, I wanna make sure it's U32, because um that would probably tell um the parsing thing to make it into U32, otherwise parse would have have a default, a different default or something. Okay, guess dot trim because you always have new lines or tabs or, or things like that when you get input from custom from the user. And parts it, and then expect it to succeed. Otherwise, 
Whoa, not a number, man. Not a number. Friend. Friend. Whoa. That's not a number. Friend. And that would be previous guess. Let's see if this would work. Um. No. Oh, expect doesn't let me do a string. So expect doesn't let me do string formatting the same way printland would be. I, I guess there is I bet there is a way to do string formatting somehow, but not right now, so I'll get rid of that. Okay. Two enter guess four. Awesome. Enter the guess. Rup, rup. Okay, so now we see what happens when we expect something to fail. Thread main panicked. At, whoa, it's not a number, friend. Uh, that, that's wacky. Okay, parse int error, kind invalid digit. Da, 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 da. Yeah, I would have wanted like to catch the error and, and print out what the error was. Insert, like Not only this, like the invalid digit. What digit was invalid and what place in the string was invalid? Um, there probably is a way to do it. We'll figure this out. Guess changes type meet program. Yeah, guess changes type meet program. Which, uh, like I said, it's weird, but it actually makes sense in those scenarios where you only have an interim value captured in a variable that you don't, you actually don't want nothing to do with it. It's just, for, you know, to capture a string and then parse it, or, you know, you when, when it's it happens. I can think about many cases where it happens during parsing of, of things from one to the other, um, parsing inputs, you just, you just, you know, use something as a temporary buffer and you always end up giving it like this weird name, like underscore str or underscore input, and then you just don't do anything with it later. It makes, makes sense. Uh, backtrace is a stack trace. Yes, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, forget about it. Forget about it. For this. And cargo run. Yeah, whoa, and yeah, now I got a lot more information about the stack race. It told me like a lot of stuff. Uh deep and why like it goes like deep, the rabbit hole goes deep all the way to to like all the way. From my start, this is probably some wrappers that Rust created for things to run. The language started, then it tries to do this, to do that. Yeah, I don't know enough about Rust now to, to make anything out of it. So let's just do this for now. Right, okay, so we guessed the number, which is pretty cool. We did a parsing thing. The U32 scene here is inside 32 int. It's a good default choice for small positive number. Small 32, okay. Then about other number ties. Additionally, U32 and addition in this example program is a comparison with secret number means a trust will infer secret number should be a U32 as well. So a comparison would be of the same type. Call the parse, does it cause an error? If it does, then we do expect thing. Da, 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 da. But what we're missing is the guesses. So, ooh, thank you so much. What we're missing here is the guesses. Yeah, I got, I got the uh, delivery of coffee. <laughs> okay, so. What I don't have yet is all the comparison stuff, right? You guess the difference is too big. So all the stuff with the comparison is not, not in the program yet. So after we printed the secret, we don't need to print a secret number anymore. We don't care about it. We know how it works, right? So please input your guess. I'm gonna read our guess and that's the guess that we actually got. 
you guessed this. And now I want to compare. So what's it? Um, match. I'm trying to do this like without looking at how it should work. So I'm going to match um, guess compare with um, yet secret number. I'm pretty sure that I'm like doing it really badly. <laughs> Ordering uh, more. Ah, I have no idea. I'm going to have to scroll back. So, duck, 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 duck. Where was it? Ordering more. Greater, not more. Okay, so we start with less. And if it's less, we're going to print length to small. Not comma or uh, oops, there's another thing that I like here. Okay, so ordering, uh, whoa. and in my mind, it's easier to do like less equal more than less greater equal. So I don't know, that's just that's just optics to be uh, yeah. Winning and then ordering um, greater print Okay, so I said was well, as I was typing, I said there's something I really like here, and that's the commas. The commas. So the last entry has comma in it. Which means I can add like lines. I can copy and paste lines around, or I can add a line without, you know, if I'm adding another option, let's say there was like a ordering what? Um, I and then I'm doing this, and then the diff and like the the, the the git commit that will have this diff would only have this line. It would not include adding a comma here. So yeah, I really like um, adding trailing commas in places. So that's one more point uh, to rust. Okay, would any of this work? Run. No, because use of undeclared type or module ordering. Oh, because I did not I did not import or use the thing, right? So let's go up and use STB CMP ordering. Now this is interesting because this is not ordered the same way that this is ordered. So I'm gonna try something. We'll see if it runs. Awesome, you put your guess four. Guess four to small, and put a guess hundred too far. I have no idea what the guess was, so I cannot because I removed the, the printout. But okay, so what I want to try now though is, is something interesting. So I'm gonna get um add to oh just to show you, I can do a git GUI from here because I started the X server. If I do a git GUI from here, get oops, I've been on the, on the other uh, on the second uh, monitor, let me get it in. So I got this thing. This is Git GUI coming from my Linux box via the X server, and 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 it's now it's on the Windows side rendering, and I can use all the Windows things like um, window right, left, up, all the stuff just works um, through the X server. It's really cool and awesome. So yeah, I did not create a commit with the initial stuff, but let's just do this. Uh, I'm gonna call it. Um, uh, guessing, guessing game kind of works only. Um, so. Now, why I did this? Oh, I'm getting ignore. It's always fun to add. Commit amend last commit. I can get ignore and commit. Woohoo! Now, um, why I did this? Because now I want to try something. I'm going to do a rust. FMT on main.rs. Is this how it works? Okay, and now I'm going to get GUI again just to show you what happened. I love this. Okay, so two things happened. First of all, it moved STDIO from here to here because of ordering, I guess, uh, it's alphabetical or something, and it added this space here, and now the program is like nicely formatted. So I'm going to add FMT here. I'm going to commit this. Now, 
uh, with proper IDE, or Vim could also have this integration in, um, every time you save a file, it would just automatically um, cross-format it, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I really like the languages today are becoming more opinionated in this way. Um, Go had it, and Rust also has it. So they just you know, instead of fighting about formatting, like if you want the curly braces here or there, or where to put your spaces, you just 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 how, that's how you do it, and that's it. Because I mean, it doesn't really matter uh, what it is as long as everybody on the same project are just doing the same thing. So you don't you know find yourself committing a huge change that just changes spacings, stuff like that. Um, it lets you focus on, you know, uh, it helps you focus on the essence of what you code instead of the, you know, the spite over the form. Okay, so we did all that. It works, but we cannot do this more than once. True, so that's not really helpful. It doesn't really work well for us. So allowing multiple guests with looping. Now we're going to need to start looping. Okay, that. <laughs> So yeah, languages have like for loops or or uh, while loops or like you know all these guys. And uh, so Go has this like notion of how do you do a for loop that doesn't like grow with because for has always three parts, right? Right, the initialize uh, the change in each step, and then you know where do you stop? But if you don't never want to stop, never want to initialize, never want to change anything. Uh, in Go, you just do a for loop, you just write for, which was always awkward. So, uh, yeah, I could have to Rust for adding the loop keyword. The uh, loop is just going to be looping through this until eternity, I guess. Uh, <laughs> that's amazing. Let's, let's go at it. So, I'm going to... So, every time I want to guess... It's going to be after we created the guesting, I guess. Let's see. So if I loop here. And here. And spacing is awkward, right? But go from B, uh, not from B. That's the thing B. Main RS. No, it's not awkward. Uh, uh, who would it work? I don't know, but eventually I'm gonna probably have to add a counter, and if you if you fail too many times, I'm gonna like throw it, throw you out. Um, just to make sure that I can uh, test uh, the case of uh, um, like test basically the eat. Uh, I'm gonna print it out. So print then stick for it. Is let's run it. So the secret was 30, so we could do 29, too small, 31. Oh, what was not a number, friend? Wait, what? That's that didn't work. Why did it not work? Okay, I think I understand what's going on. I think every time... Okay. <laughs> All right, so guess here is a string. And then inside here, guess becomes a non-string, like a number. And then it goes here, and then trying to read line into guess, which is like not a string anymore. Like everything here is like broken up. Because at this point, guess became like something weird. I don't know why it didn't error. But no, we could not trim it. Like something here, something uh, something is broken. Um, if I just take this here and put it here, remove that guy. Format, and then run. Let's see, thirty-one is going to be too small. Um, 33 is going to be too far. 32 is going to eat. I never I need to break after this. <laughs> I need to break. Surely I need to break after this from the loop. Uh, uh, how do I break? So let me guess. I'm not going to look inside there. So the way I'm going to try to do this, I'm going to add, make this into a full block. 
and then break. I mean, I'm doing K. I want to see if I get like if if it's gonna paint it in a separate color for me. So there's a break. There's a break keyword in the language. I'm gonna close it. Do this now. This is not an expression or it's a statement or whatever here. But this is. I need a comma here. Okay, let's see if this works. That would be awesome if it is working. So, uh, oh wait, I did it on the. I did all this in the greater, not in the equal case. So, take and. Uh, Went too far. Format this and run this. So eighty three, eighty two, too low, eighty four, too far, eighty three, git. Okay, so yeah, guessing guessing that using the break keyword would work uh, was not a that wasn't a yeah equal open a new wing break that that was an easy guess okay remember that we talked about what to do okay awesome so um we had a question before what happens how do we deal with failures in a better way so instead of expect which would panic on anything that's not okay we can match on it because there are multiple options here, right? It's an enum. So if it's an OK with some number, then we're going to do something with the number. If it's aired, then we're just going to skip it. Um, instead of that, it would just say, not, don't skip it, just say, this is um, not a good number. OK, cool. So if I run it, again, if I run it again, I print it some non number, it would, whoa, it would freak out. So instead, I'm going to I'm going to go and do here instead of expect. I'm going to match. So match this thing. I'll delete to the end of the line. And if it's an OK and the num number was that, then this match expression is going to return the number. Otherwise, if it's not okay and I don't care what the error is, what I'm going to do is print then um, um, vigor if I or if um, it's, it's not a number. And now I can add what does the guess that was brought in. And I'm going to return nothing. What's continue? I guess continue to not do anything. Hmm. Can I return to continue? Let's see. Maybe I can. Maybe I can. Save it. Format, ooh, could not format it because expected pattern. Let's see what I did wrong here. So guess equals match guess string parse. And if it's this, then that is, oh, you're right. Because this, this is option number one, okay, comma. Option number two, error, comma. And then I need to close this bracket with this, and then and then semicolon. Okay, awesome. Format and run. Couldn't run it because it's Rintlen without a bank, so it's not a macro. Ready to do this here. Okay, so my guess is none. This is not a number, none. Try again, 95, hit. Switching from an expect to 
match expression is how you generally move from crashing on error to handling the error. Remember that parse returns a result type, so we can choose what to do. If parse is able to successfully return a string, turn the string into a number, it will return OK value. Otherwise, it would return an error. The underscore is because we don't care what it is. It would hear like whatever the error thing. It's gonna, it's gonna. Um, we're gonna do something with that. We could have like captured, I guess, the error, like the error colon ex or the exception or whatever it's called here, the error error, and use it if you if you liked. Okay, we got all this. We can delete the initial print len so that we don't screw this up. Then let's just do it and have fun with it. So the secret is this group. And run the game. Okay. So input your guess. Um one, no, two, no, three, no, no, just kidding. Um fifty, too small, seventy-five, too small, uh, eighty-seven. Too far. Um, 80. Too small. 83. Too far. 82. 81. Yeah. Awesome. At this point, you've successfully built a guessing game. Congratulations. Okay, we learned about let and mute and matches. We did some methods. We did associated functions, which were associated on the type and associated on the, on the instance itself. We loaded crates. Did a lot of stuff. Chapter three would cover concept most programming languages have as variable data types functions. Okay, so I guess until now we just you know dabbled around with the language and built some stuff, but we'll learn uh, in chapter four and, and then later on about the actual things that happens, like why why did I write these things? Eventually I'll be able to understand what's the what's the deal with the macro, I guess. Um, okay, cool. Um, so guessing game in Rust done. Um, we can ship it. Uh, what do we do when we ship it? I'm gonna get add first main dot rs and get commit yes message. Uh, I guess if it's working now. Yay! Again, git k also works through the windowing thing. For me, so I can do that. I can increase the font so you can see it. Maybe how do you increase fonts here? Okay, so we had the initial commit, then we had formatting, and then the game works. Um, we probably want to format this again. Let's see. First, MP. Uh, what's the MP main address? Nothing changed. Okay. Pretty cool. Um, I really enjoyed this. I think um, it's it's fun for me to um, go again to, to a complete beginner sort of uh, um, feeling, and uh, that's that that that's an interesting feeling because I'm, I'm I'm used to working with languages that I know a lot about. I can you know I know exactly what I'm doing and and. Most often, I would even know what's happening all the way down the stack. The stack, uh, and here I have no idea what's going on. Uh, but it's it's fun. Uh, I hope you enjoy the ride as well, as much as I do. And uh, see you in the next episode. Bye. And I'm gonna need to find a button that stops your streaming. There it is. Bye now. <laughs>